Hi everyone, Anthony of the Olga Iglesias Project here, and I'm at the historic Conservatory of Music of Puerto Rico, and I'm going to be talking to Rosalind Pabón, the first Puerto Rican you ever to conduct the Symphony Orchestra of Puerto Rico. Welcome, Rosalind. Saludos. I want to thank you for taking the time out y hablar con nosotros. Yeah, bueno, para mí un gran placer, especialmente hablar de... de de nuestra gente, de nuestro conservatorio, de, encantado de estar aquí. Quería empezar un poco en cuanto a eh, tu vida mayagüez de niño. Cuéntame un poco de tu experiencia de niño atendiendo la Escuela Libre de Música de Mayagüez. Uh, well, you know, um, I grew up in a very musical home, although no, none of my parents or relatives were musicians. Um, but, you know, music was part of our life, uh, radio, uh, uh, records of the time and uh, music at church, at church, you know. And we used to have a lot of uh, uh, activities, uh, like children choirs and this kind of thing. And my father loved uh, popular music, but my mother loved classical music. So we used to listen to both. We used to listen to a lot of the popular music of the time uh, on the radio. And my mother uh, used to uh, have her little record player, Vitrola, they used to call it that was in those days. And then we would listen to uh, mostly, uh, you know, well-known masters of the uh, symphonic or piano repertoire. But it wasn't until around, uh, I was turning 12 years old that uh, uh, they came to my younger sister's school. Uh, uh, they were recruiting, they were recruiting uh, students for the new music schools that has started in 1946. The first three were San Juan, Ponce, and Mayagüez. And uh, that's how I, I went into the music school with my, accompanying my younger sister. And I started there uh, taking first solfege because it was, that was the way it was done then. First, you have to learn to read music <laughs> and they would make you uh, for like one semester just do solfege, you know? Something happened when I was, when I turned 15, that I think was very important. I was then organist at the Episcopal Church in Mayagüez, which had a, a full organ, you know, two keyboards and, a, and, a, and the foot keyboard. And uh, a priest came to that church who had graduated from the Conservatory of Music in Madrid. His name was Ignacio Morales Nieva. And then instead of firing me because I was, uh, because he was such a fine organist, no, they let me stay. And then he became my, uh, also my teacher. So I studied organ with him and solfege and, and sight reading, the technique of the, you know, the uh, organ uh, playing. So that was also a very rich uh, uh, background for me because yeah. I was doing so many different things. Uh, I used to play the accordion by ear. Wow. Piano accordion. And uh, and then when I was turning, when I turned 17 or 16 or 17, um, I was trying to come, I wanted to come to the conservatory here, which has started in 1960. Right. But in 1963, they sent me to a conservatory in the U.S. Peabody. Peabody Conservatory. In George, Baltimore. George Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, Maryland, where I studied in there, my bachelor's degree. In, Were in, you on scholarship? Yeah, from the government of Puerto Rico. That's great. And, and the municipality of Mayagüez. $25 a month. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, $25. Imagine my room and board for the whole semester cost, the cost was $350 for the whole semester. Wow. So room and board, you know, I had my, ah, my room had a piano, two meals a day, you know, with the walking distance of the conservatory. What a concept. <laughs> it was a different life. Totally. Different time. But then I was also very lucky there because I was so young and uh, it was so demanding. I realized how much I had to learn. I was probably way behind from the rest of the uh, students there. So that the level was so demanding that, you know, that I had to really, really work. And catch up. And catch up. 
But I graduated in four years. And from being from Mayaguez to Baltimore, that should have been a really interesting, challenging transition for you. Oh, it was very shocking, I tell you. The cultural change, I could barely speak English, uh, so that made it very hard. Although, my, my piano teacher, which is my major, was uh, Catalan. Mm -hmm. So he spoke Spanish very well, and at least I had a, a, an ally. An ally there. <laughs> and um, interesting enough, look, my solfest teacher was French. My piano teacher was Spaniard. And my harmony and theory was uh, British. So there were a lot of Europeans there, which uh, made my my stay at Peabody uh, very nice because you know they, I, uh, they it was such a cosmopolitan uh, environment, you know. And then there were students, music students from everywhere. Yeah, so, interesting. Were you the only Puerto Rican at the time? The only Puerto Rican. We were only. We were only, um, there was a guy from Venezuela, Carlos Mendoza, uh, who, who studied conducting. I, I never heard from him again. There was one from uh, Bolivia, Fernando Sanz Guerrero. I don't remember his name. He was also studying conducting. There was a, a, a guy from Uruguay who became a very well-known composer, Sergio Cervetti, Cervetti or Cervetti. And that's it, we were like, like only like four or five Spanish speaking uh, students at the conservatory at the time. And you got your degree in piano? In piano. At a wonderful time. Imagine with the Baltimore Symphony, I even saw a concert with Stravinsky conducting. Mm. I saw Aaron Copland. I saw uh, Elizabeth Schwartz called uh, Ormandy. The Philadelphia Orchestra used to come every two weeks or something and, give, and do a concert in Baltimore. And I used to go and see those concerts. So I saw Ormandy conducting, you know. Uh, That's wonderful. Oystra, uh, the great, the great artist of the time. Then after Peabody, you came back to Puerto Rico, and you were studying with San Roma for a number of years. I worked with San Roma for like two years. But when it came to teaching, it was very strict, uh, very demanding. And you have to be really well prepared, not only to play the music, or, but you have to know the background of the music, uh, the, all about the, the piece you were playing, the, the form, the, the, the historical uh, background of the work of the composer. And a lesson could last two, three hours. You couldn't, you couldn't come to, to, to take a lesson with San Román with limited time, they say, oh, maestro, do they only have an hour? You know, no. You, you have to be there uh, to come there ready to spend maybe two or three hours with him, which happened to me. And I, I remember that that um, the lessons always were open. You, know, you could be uh, playing a sonata by uh, Mozart, for instance, and suddenly a student would show up and he would ask him in, and then he would start uh, a discussion about that sonata with that student also. And then if there were any any uh, 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 concerns or doubts or, 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 uh, uh, he, or if he noticed that, that, that you weren't uh, quite uh, prepared in, in, in that part of the, of, the, of, of what you should have known about that work, then he would open his <laughs> his uh, armario, you know, his uh, chest of drawers. Yeah, he, and he'll put out a book, and then he'll show you. You know, he the lesson was not only about playing; the lesson had to be about everything related to what that work that you were playing at the time. So that made his classes very, not only very, very interesting and very rewarding personally, but it showed you that you had to come prepared in every element related to what you were going to do that day. Um, I know because it happened to me. And I know sometimes there were two or three more students there. And then he will ask their opinions also about what you were doing and what you were playing. It was um, quite a different uh, uh, approach 
into piano pedagogy, but I think it was very uh, interesting and at the same, at the same time very uh, worthwhile because you really got a lot out of it. Then I got involved so much in doing everything. I was doing everything. I was teaching music at school, at school. I was playing popular music. I played popular music because I needed to work. I had a daughter, a young daughter. I needed, I needed, I needed to work. Pay the bills. And, uh, and uh, a musical live here, live music was like great. You know, they were, I mean, I remember playing uh, at Hotel La Concha at, at, at a time there, we were probably employed there at the hotel, maybe 20, 30 musicians. Wow. So I, I, I did many things, and then um, then I began conducting. Somebody saw me conducting, which was uh, uh, Augusto Rodriguez. Who was the choral master. The choral master. And he liked very much my what I was doing, and he uh, recommended me. When people would need a, a conductor for a, an opera, a, chorus con, a choral conductor, he would he would recommend me, and then I would I started conducting, and that's how I got into conducting at University of Indiana. Yes, that's when I asked San, San Roma that I wanted to get ready for. I remember I called San Roma, and because one of the requirements for a degree is they give you what they call an applied music examination, where you have to show your performance level of. Uh, a bachelor's degree performance level in any instrument. In, in this case, piano, right? So I called San Roma, and then for my harmony counterpoint, I called Morales Nieva, who had been my teacher back in Mayagüez when I was 15. So I, I prepared myself with those two, uh, and then I went to Indiana. And the reason I went to Indiana was because I was, I prepared one of the works I, jobs I had, before that was with uh, preparing the chorus for the opera Madame Butterfly. Mm. And the baritone, uh, who did the sharpless uh, role in that, in that production, was a, a, one of our top baritone uh, singers, uh, Pablo Elvira, who was a very good friend of all that. Yes, I, uh. Pablo Elvira was, was one of the persons who first told me, uh, you know, Pablo, I think you've got talent for this. Why don't you go t study conducting? Yeah. So um, that started working on my mind. Planted the seed. That's why I went to Bloomington. And um, Pablo Elvira was uh, also. Look, like I've mentioned, uh, I've mentioned to you, if I want to make a, a if this is this is not very smart because sometimes you forget names. But uh, San Roma, eh, Morales Nieva, Ignacio Morales Nieva, Augusto Rodriguez. Uh, 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 Pablo Elvira uh, uh, were people at that time that um, encouraged me to study conducting and also helped me. Yeah. Other when I went to Bloomington, I, the first year was very hard, very difficult because of the econ economics. But then I got a grant from the F Ford Foundation. Oh, good. And then I was a fellow there uh, for my doctorate degree. And then I, I you know, then I had, uh, economically I had a relief that I could study. Uh, my wife at the time, Susan Young, who had been a student of Olga Iglesias. Yes. Uh, she also did her master's degree there. And Susan we Young, correct me if I'm wrong, she was from Puerto Rico as well. She was a uh, Marylander. From Maryland. Oh, we I met see. a Peabody. Oh, I understand now. Yeah. Okay, I had made a Marylander. Okay. She was from uh, Carroll County, Maryland. <laughs> Did she speak Spanish? She learned here uh, the hard way. The hard way. Yeah. Well, since she was a singer, you know, the, right. she had a good knowledge of a Italian, French, 
So the funny thing is that she spoke Spanish with a Puerto Rican accent. And because you were married to Susan Young, that's how you meet Olga Iglesias. Yeah, because when we came, we had the need in 1968, when we came first back from Peabody, mm -hmm. we had the need to, to study and become part of the musical community yeah. here in San Juan. So I went to Cisan Roma and, and then she went, she didn't study with Olga first, she studied with uh, the professor at the conservatory, who was Doña Ángeles Otén, Española. The teacher, Pilar Dorengar. Yes, the, who also was Olga's teacher. Who was Olga's teacher also, and then when, when, when uh, uh, Doña Ángeles left the conservatory, then Susan became a student of Olga Iglesias. And then that's, we began the wonderful relationship we had for many years with Olga and with Bobby, her husband. Yeah, my grandfather. And I, you know, we have a video of you conducting 1982 at Bellas Artes, uh, a work by Jose Pedrera, and Olga's there singing. And that's some of the few footage I have of you in our collection. Going back to the Conservatory Orchestra, when I first, the first concert I did with the Conservatory Orchestra, I asked the maestro, uh, San Roma, to be uh, the soloist, and um, he opened my first season with the Conservatory Orchestra, which I still conduct. The second concert that we did that year with the Conservatory Orchestra, your grandmother was a soloist. And she sang, uh, I asked her, I said, Olga, would you sing with me? With the and she said, sort of, well, you know, I'm sort of retired, I'm not doing that. I said, well, you know, I would love for you to, to, to come and sing with us. She did. Remember, this encounter with, with this wonderful artist, with, for the students at such a young age, right. Is, it, it, don't, it, don't, it, don't, it not only enriches them uh, musically, but they, it gives them uh, role models. They, they see what artists can become, you know, and they also see their kindness to share. You know, that's, I, to me, that's even more important. When, when, and that's something that happens a lot in music. This encounter of people on stage, you know, of different ages, of, the, of different uh, backgrounds, of different uh, nationalities, whatever you want to, that, and then you see how that all gels into one. Yes, it provides them an example, somebody to look up to, a role model, and there's so many figures of yeah. the classical music Puerto Rican history that 
needs to be more brought to light. No, and then you know, I I can I can say with pride, I not only with San Roman, with Olga, with the Figueroa family, correct, with the Hutchinson family, with the with the uh, Morla family. These are all Madera. These are all families, and with the rest of a a, a, a large amount of very wonderful Puerto Rican artists that had given everything to Puerto Rico when 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 there was hardly any uh, uh, economical uh, uh, compensation compensation you know no I, and I mean there was a lot of things happening here before Casals came oh absolutely there's there been a, a long of, tradition of classical music yeah there was a lot of I am very lucky that I had lived that Puerto Rico at that time you know where where when local singers like Olga uh, 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 Pablo Elvira, Elvira, Ustino Diaz, a young, a young the young Ustino, yeah. You know, we had this rich vocal uh, uh, tradition. Tradition, yeah. Not only in piano, in voice, yeah. We're sitting on their shoulders, yeah. For me, as the founder and the executive director of this project, a big part of the inspiration is to bring this to the people, the history that we have here, you know, of the classical music tradition. Just to give you an example of uh, kindness and uh, and support when you need it. I remember my first concert with the symphony. I was really uh, nervous. You know? uh -huh. It was such a, a, what do you call it, a, a responsibility. Here I am, uh, a Puerto Rican conducting the orchestra for the first time. And then I, would, I was so nervous. Uh, before the entrance, and Doña Luz Hutchinson, Henry's mother, looks at me and she said, you're just doing fine, don't worry, it's going to be great, you're going to have a wonderful concert. This is Doña Luz. So and much goodwill. Oh, yes. For me to be a part of this legacy, I'm so humbled and proud, and I'm not a musician, people know that, but I uh, take this very seriously because... Um, well, I, I would too if I were you. <laughs> Rosaline, this has been a fantastic conversation, fantastic, and I want to thank you for bringing in your insights and your knowledge about the history and about your life, about the classical music here. Oh, to me it's a pleasure. I, I am very happy to be part of this effort and because it's really important that projects like this continue especially at this time when our young people need every effort and every opportunity to grow, to, to, to become uh, uh, first-class artists like, like, like we want to or like they want. Thank Sorry. you. See, si, Olga was here for the students. She taught here in the conservatory for several years. So through the project, we help students and bring the history to life. I think that uh, we, need, we need more projects than this one. Thank you, Rosaline. That means a lot. Thank you for your time again. Éxito. Gracias.